Welcome back to Co-op Radio 102.7 FM CFRO. This is Monday from Bagger. My name is Reginald Angus Argue. I'm archiving this on my website of www.reginaldangusargue.com. The next guest is a producer of numerous TV shows. He ran for mayor in, uh, here in Vancouver in 2005 as an independent. He's an outspoken activist who wants to see positive changes happening here in Vancouver to help out the people. With that said, I'd like to introduce uh, James Carl Green. Hello, James. Good morning, Rich. Well, thank you so much for coming on. The first thing I want to talk about is, you know, you and I, we, we talked about the what's going on with the Olympic Village and the fact that there's a... Uh, there, they, they paid off the, the developers, they bailed them out at the right. tune of about a billion dollars. You know, what we have to look at here in Vancouver, the citizens of Vancouver are now on, on the, basically, they owe this money now. So what kind of uh, debt has uh, the current mayor amassed since coming to office uh, in regards to what happened during the Olympics and even after the Olympics? How many billions of dollars has this mayor amassed for debt-wise that the citizens of Vancouver are now responsible for? Well, I think you have to look at um, not just the mayor, but the council and the direction of the city in terms of the city manager and the whole administration. I, uh, you know, I don't think we can pin one thing on the mayor. The mayor is one vote. He is the leader of the city. But we're talking major amounts of money, and the problem is we can add up to billions of dollars. We can add up things like buying the Van Ock building for the Vancouver City Police at $21 million. We've got big expenditures, slush fund for the Olympics of $21 million. We've got huge salaries going out. The, um, the big problem at City Hall, as I see it, is just a lack of a social agenda in fiscal management. You know, um, there's, the, the word really comes down to waste, and it comes down to lacking priorities. And the difficulty we have, Reg, as I see it, is that we have people that get elected to these positions that go in. When they get elected, they have these, this idealism that they're going to fix things. And when they get s- snug in their seats around council tables and, you know, um, boardroom tables, they forget the mandate. And the mandate really is that you have to, as an elected person, and, you know, you probably know I've been a school trustee before, you have to have a, the public interest has to be first and foremost. So the spending and the wild spending at City Hall, I call, I've been saying that they spend like drunken sailors. It goes on and on and on. And the only way you can really stop that is if the people that are in power actually, and the people in the community get active and start speaking to these people and saying, look, you were there for our public interest, not the interest of yourself or of your political parties. So, it, you know, it goes into probably up to $1.5 billion or whatever uh, if you look at the spending. And I call it waste spending as opposed to social spending for all of the programs that are required to make our city a better place. And, uh, James, I wanted to quickly uh, interject there uh, for a moment. And quickly, uh, you know, I wanted to add something. Uh, this is not reference this interview, but when we had problems at the beginning, uh, when I was saying that, you know, we were, we were experiencing acts of sabotage. Now, I'm not pointing this out towards the staff of Co-op Radio. Um, I just point out there are some people here who are volunteering. It just, it just basically it just seems uh, kind of weird how uh, so many things are happening to the program of Monday Brown Bagger, then, you know, you just put two and two together and all the different acts that have been done against uh, myself doing this program and also other people do other programs here on Co-op Radio. It's amazing how fast, you know, our voice has been, they've uh, attempted to silence us. Now, I just wanted to quickly add that. And with that said there, James, you know, I wanted to quickly talk about, you know, what happened to you when you ran for mayor in 2005? You know, how did Vision, and I think the developer you were telling me about called Millennium Developer, uh, what were they involved with that, that caused you to lose that race? Well, that's a long story. I've actually written a book that probably people could get a hold of called To Be Mayor of Vancouver, and it explains the election. I'm not really at this stage uh, focusing on 2005. I just know that. In 2005, there were a lot of, I would call, dirty tricks and dirty behavior, um, uh, and that uh, the way, when you, the difficult part of it, or the realistic part of it, I should say, is that when you enter into the fray, you can expect dirt to fly. So, um, not, you know, there's a lot I could go into and say a lot of things about dirty tricks, but, you know, I'm more focused, quite frankly, Rich, on moving forward and working to make the city a better place. And that experience was probably one of the better experiences of my life. I learned a lot more about politics than I'd ever known. 
And uh, you know what? The other thing Greg, I have to say is when people, when people's power are threatened, it's and you know you, put, it's the old saying if you you know you go, you get a rat in the corner, he gets frightened. Well, you know there are a lot of people that saw a threat and so they acted like rats in a corner and they yeah. did a lot of dirty things. But that's fine. I do, you know you can't you can't dwell on the past in politics. You got to look at moving forward. Yeah, what I, I totally believe that the people should have should be served. I mean, what I thought, excuse me, what my thoughts are in democracy is of the people, for the people, and by the people. Um, and I think that's that, a hard one. The the uh, I think another one goes good with goes well with that one, Rich, is that when and I don't know who said this, but they said when people fear government, it's called a dictator. When government fears people, fear the people, it's called democracy. Yeah, I, I remember that one. I think it was. Um, if I remember properly, I think that's uh, Thomas Jefferson. No, I'm, uh, you... yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But what we have really is we just need to turn around. And there, I gotta say, there are some good. People. It's not. I don't want to make a blanket statement and say that we have bad people in government. We just have people that aren't focused on a social agenda and fiscal fiscal responsibility and taking a business approach to running a city. We've got people that have, unfortunately. Uh, that have a one agenda, like a green agenda, and a green agenda is good, but you know, the biggest problem that, as I see it, and we need to solve this, are the social issues in a city. The, if we don't deal with, when social problems uh, get as large as they are in any city, it erodes democracy, it, re- it erodes the standard of living and the quality of living for everybody. And we're just not dealing with those issues. And those issues, if you don't mind me saying, are crime fighting and social issues and women's safety issues and drug and alcohol and the sex trade and, tra- and trafficking and affordable housing. And we have so many issues that, uh, that are going untouched uh, that what ha- is going to happen if we don't start readjusting our thinking and our agenda at City Hall and in the province and, and in fact, in the, in the country, we are not, we're going to have a society that is not quite the standard of being the best place on earth in which to live. You know, and that, the best place on earth in which to live, as far as I see it, is for everybody. You know, it's not just for the, that top few of interest, the top interest groups that have a lot of cash. You know, it has to be in a democracy, and, we're, and unfortunately we're far away from that. Yep. So I, I don't think that, in a pure sense, we can call ourselves a democracy, and that's a problem that I that I face every day. Yeah, and in the past, you and I were we're discussing in front of City Hall, you know, how City Hall needs to cut some of its, uh, you know, expenditures. Hmm. You know, you, I remember you basically mentioning to me how, you know, with the the fact that you and I were talking about the art gallery. The art gallery needs to move to a bigger location because it's massive, you know, uh, stuff in storage right now. And with the city all, you know, the, the, the high cost that they're paying to all their, their legal funds and everything, they're keeping lawyers on salary. And, and, you know, and I remember you mentioning the fact that city hall would actually be better if they moved it to downtown and then put it in buildings throughout the downtown core and and then basically you know gave that that city hall building to the art gallery and you know that way we're saving on not only are we are we saving on uh, the cost of you know building a new building for the art gallery but we're also saving on uh, we're we're saving money for the citizens here of Vancouver i mean the the people they're running the city of Vancouver right now they're going to have to come up with some tough decisions real fast because as i was mentioning in the last show last interview, United States of America, the economy is collapsing. I mean, we're, we're talking uh, $45.5 trillion just uh, off this uh, this uh, mortgage fraud going, foreclosure fraud, excuse me, what it's called. And, and, and then you add to that about the $60 trillion that they owe for other stuff. I mean, there's, there's no way the United States can keep going. And the fact that 75% of what we produce is being sent to the United States, it's only a matter of time before it affects Canada. So what the people that are running the city of Vancouver need to focus on right now is how can we take you know the surplus that we have from selling off different city properties and use that to insulate ourselves from the coming tidal wave of the financial destruction that's going to happen right off the United States, it's going to come right over top of Canada. 
That's what they should yeah, do. Well, let's start. You know, there's a lot there. Let's go back to the very beginning of what you said, perhaps, and talk about the art gallery just as a because the art gallery and the expansion that removed the art galleries is probably a perfect example of lack of priorities. We do have an art gallery now, and until we put the millions of dollars and services behind these social issues I'm talking about, and I'm not just talking social issues, I'm talking about small businesses. You know, I live in the Canby area, and there's businesses closing. We, you know, every day, not every month, there's a new business that's gone under. So what, all, what I'm really saying, Reg, is it's time to put uh, put the brakes on spending, not spending and complete, completed, but spending in areas that don't improve small businesses and don't improve the lives of every day. And I don't like that term every day, but of Vancouverites. You know, we're we're putting money into these edifices like the the five hundred million dollars for a roof for GM Place, the the five hundred million dollar overrun to build a convention center, the million dollars to spruce up City Hall, all of that kind of spending, the, you know, the, is is fine in, in wonderful t- economic times. Oh, go and spend. You know, obviously I'm exaggerating to go and spend, but the point is, uh, uh, the crux of this area is even in the United States, the crux of the problem was is that yes, you need perhaps to bail out some banks, but you need to first and foremost bail out house, uh, people that are losing their homes, people that are losing their jobs. The trillions of dollars spent uh, is being spent from the top down, and the money needed to be spent from the bottom up. And that's the same at every level of government we have. We need to get down to realizing that, in, for example, in this city, we look at the needs of, of people that have families, of working people, of middle class people, and stop spending for our own self aggrandizement to be able to say we're putting a roof that opens and closes on BC Play. Nice thought, but the problem is when you've got uh, the high level of sexual assaults of women, you need more police officers and more investigation of those crimes. You need services, you need housing for the hard, the, the, the hard, the, to the hard or difficult or hard to ho- to to house, such as uh, people that are on our streets that are alcoholics, that are uh, that are mentally ill, that are addicted. Those people need treatment. So what I, I can go through a long list and keep going through the list. The reality is, is we're so far away from dealing with the realities, and I call the underbelly of our city in terms of crime and some of these issues, that to spend all these millions of dollars on these other areas it is like a drunken sailor in a way. It's like our eyes are closed to the needs of people. And it may sound corny because politicians say this a lot, but without addressing funding and our services to people, and it's not just people on the street. There are a lot of people that have two children that are looking for proper daycare services that can't, that are fighting and struggling every day. We need to look at how we can support families as, as opposed to support big wealthy interests. And I'm not saying developers and wealthy people are the enemy, but they need we need to make sure that the interest of all people are are treated equally at the table. Not the case right now in Vancouver and in British Columbia. The case right now is special interests have the ear, and they make these big contributions to these politicians, and the politicians uh, are their servants when it comes to making decisions about how money is spent and how. And that is what I'm talking about. We need a whole new agenda. And we're not getting it. We're getting more of the same. 